while the main part of the French and Eversole feud took place between the years of 1887 and 1894, it can be argued that it was not finally settled until 1913 with the death of Benjamin French. This feud was very unusual because of the social and economic status of the main participants. As it turns out, both French and Eversole were very wealthy merchants and attorneys with a great deal of power and influence in Perry County, Kentucky. Both men married into the socially elite class of the county and were doing very well for themselves. And both sides owned huge tracts of land in Perry County. At one time, the two men were friendly toward each other. The two men would eventually come to loggerheads with each other and the deaths in the county would be somewhere between 20 to 74 depending on which historical account you go with. Come along with us as we discover why the feud started and how it ended. All aboard the Kentucky Tennessee Living Time Machine! Please fasten your seat belts and keep your arms and legs inside of the vehicle at all times. But to get going we need your help. We still need to fire up the time machine to transport us. Please help us by clicking on the like, subscribe, and bell notification buttons down below. Not only does this fire up the time machine, but it convinces YouTube that we need a bigger time machine to reach more people who love history as much as you do. Now, back to our story. The Lives of Eversole and French we will take a brief look at both men in this conflict as to their family, political, and business lives. Joseph Castle Eversole One of the main players in the French Eversole feud would be Joseph Castle Eversole. He was born on July 26, 1852 to Major John C. Eversole and Nancy Ann Duff. He was one of nine known children born to the Union. Even though there is no existing evidence that Eversole ever had a law degree, he did work as an attorney at law. At that time in history, a degree was not required to practice. He is also listed as a merchant as well as a politician in Perry County. He held elected offices in the school board as well as the sheriff. He was also a delegate representing the Kentucky 10th District to the 1884 Republican National Convention held in June of that year. The Eversole family was one of four known first settler families that came to Perry County, Kentucky. The other three were the Duff, Combs, and Cornett families. Eversole would marry Susan Combs on May 31, 1871, and they would have seven children together in their union, five of which would live on to adulthood. Their children were William C. Eversole, 1873 to 1943, John Boyd Eversole, 1875-1910, to 1910, Lily C. Eversole, 1877-1878, to 1878, Martha Alice Eversole, 1878-1879, to 1879, Dr. Chester Arthur Eversole, 1881-1967, to Clara Bell Eversole, 1883-1967, to She married Kentucky politician William Manning Cornett and Harry Clay Eversole, 1885 to 1939, sometimes referred to as one Arm Harry. Benjamin Fulton Finch While French was a native of Tennessee, he did marry a woman by the name of Susan Lewis. The Lewis family was one of the most influential families that were in Breathitt, Leslie, and other counties in the area. There is not a lot of information that we can find out about Mr. French's personal life at this point. However, he was shot and would die from his wounds in 1913 by Harry Clay Eversole, Joseph Castle Eversole's son. Two Causes for the Feud There are two causes that are listed for the feud between the two men, but for every feud there has to be at least two reasons. A slight or insult of some kind or a push for money or power in the area. While the first account of the reason for the feud is plausible and more feasible, the second account may have also happened. And again, it could be any combination of the two reasons put together. That is the way with Appalachian stories. One or both of them could have a huge dose of truth to them. Coal and Land Rights 
The Appalachian Mountains are rich in coal. Coal mining has taken place in several areas in the mountains, but it usually took place near an easy access waterway to ship the coal out to other regions in the country. When the railway companies began building tracks across the mighty Appalachians, the coal companies were not far behind them, buying up huge tracts of land mineral rights for mining. What the companies would do is have one or more agents go around to each of the landowners and offer to buy the mineral rights from their land. They would never offer to buy the land outright. This way, they could get the land for pennies on the dollar, as people thought that it was free money. That there was no way that the farmers thought that they could move them off of their land to get to the minerals that the land contained. How wrong they were. Seeing an opportunity to make money, French decided to work with the coal companies as one of their agents. He would go around to the farmers, many of them who were illiterate, and get them to sign away their mineral rights with a mark or an X. French felt that it was his job to get the rights for as low a price as possible. Eversole was on the other side of the fence. His view was these farmers were kinfolk and you didn't cheat family. His loyalty laid with the families in the area. Eversol then began going around to the families telling them that French was going to try to cheat them out of their land for the coal rights. He also pointed out that French was not a native of the area and so he had no loyalty whatsoever to them. The actions of both Eversol and French began resentment between the two men. Both men then began to raise personal armies with it being reported that French paid $2 to $2.50 a day for each man that was a hired gun. On count of a woman. The romantic tale begins with a man that was working for French's mercantile store and he was madly in love with a woman. The man became insanely jealous one day when he saw the love of his life speaking with Benjamin French. It is unclear of what the motive of the man could have been. If he just wished to get rid of what he thought was a romantic rival, or if he truly wanted to warn Eversole of a plot to kill him. The man in question is not named in any of the sources, but this may change in the future. The man went to Joseph Eversole, stating that he had overheard French, saying that he wanted to kill him. According to Chaz G. Mensenberg in his book, Kentucky's Famous Feuds and Tragedies, written in 1917, quote, The tale-bearer, who shall be nameless, related how French had planned to rid himself of his business rival and thus make for himself a clear field for mercantile operations. That French expected to accomplish his purpose with the aid of trusty hired assassins and that one part of the plan, the employment of a reliable murderer, had been entrusted to him. The informant, who had been promised any amount of money necessary for this purpose, had a partnership with French in the business as a future reward for his services, unquote. Not believing the clerk, as there had not been any trouble between the two men, Eversol told the clerk to sign a sworn affidavit stating that he had told him about the plot. Once the affidavit was signed, Eversol began to fear for his life, so he started gathering together armed men for his protection. Upon hearing that Eversol was gathering armed men against him, French began doing the same thing. Now, how can this be plausible? If there was already a conflict with the coal rights and the people were already having resentment against French for his role, then the account of the love-struck clerk would make sense as to why Eversole believed him after he signed out a sworn affidavit. But the question remains, why did the clerk feel that he had to go to this extreme? Could he not confront his boss about seeing the woman? And was any of this even a true story or just an Appalachian tale to explain why all of a sudden both sides gathered up arms against each other? We will let you, our audience, decide upon this matter. The fear of ambush or outright war began to grow in Perry County, and soon the first shots would be fired, and the peace of the Appalachian Mountains would be disturbed for many years. Silas Gayhart 
The very first death in the French ever sold feud is somewhat disputed. In the book, Kentucky's Famous Feuds and Tragedies, it is claimed that over a dozen men ambushed and killed Silas Gayhart. Silas was a friend to Gayhart and part of his hired hands. The French faction claimed that Eversol and his faction had killed Gayhart. The Eversol faction denied this and claimed that Gayhart died because of another dispute that he had going on at the same time. Also, according to the book, quote, it has been stated and contended that killing of Gayhart was an affair entirely disconnected with the French Eversol controversy. That the man had fallen the victim of a quarrel he had with persons not members of the clan. This may be true, and it may not. It is difficult in such social upheavals to get an unvarnished truth. When crimes are committed under the cover of black night, from well-secreted places, suspicion might point in the wrong direction and accuse the innocent. For this reason, it is best to abstain from the charges not definitely established beyond any sort of doubt. The result of the Gayhart murder, however, was the same as if he had been publicly assassinated by the Everso clan, for the French believed that Gayhart lost his life because of his friendship for him, unquote. Whether or not the Everso faction did the crime or not, it would be the moment that the French faction would take up arms and declare war. From this moment forward, there was no turning back. The First Shootout The same source talks about the first shootout in Hazard, Kentucky a short time later. French had left Hazard during the winter of 1886-1877 to, to find more hired men. Musenberg writes in his book, quote, Many theories are advanced in the explanation of this singular action. Some attributed it to fear. Those better acquainted with the temper and makeup of the French clan scouted the idea and suggested that French was seeking reinforcement in the country and that at an opportune moment he would sweep down upon the village, trap the hemmed in Eversoles, and annihilate them with overwhelming forces. Unquote. Everso had discovered that French and his men had evacuated Hazard, and so Everso withdrew his men to a part of the country where his sympathizers were located, except for a couple of them he left in town. He used these men as bait should the French faction return. Everso had planned to do an attack of his own when French and his recruits had returned to town. In his thinking, if French should discover the small troop of men and choose to sweep in and overtake them, then Everso could attack him from the rear and overtake their position. Neither side was fooled by the other one's tactical maneuvers. Musenberg again writes in his book, quote, Everso scouted everywhere, frequently on the trail of French. During the month of June and the dark of night, the latter re-entered Hazard, took position of his fortified places where most of his men remained secreted, while the more daring of them walked the streets the next morning, bantering the Eversoles that had been left in town. Their leader was once notified by messenger to the country of the state of affairs. He had put in a few men with them at that time, but these started for town. Seven or eight men, fortunately for him, joined his ranks on the way. It was late in the day when Hazard was reached, but the lateness of the hour did not defer attack. From well-selected positions, the Everso opened a plunging fire upon the housed-up Frenchmen. These replied to the fuselage with equal spirit. Hundreds of shots were fired with great expenditure of ammunition and without appreciable result. Only one man was seriously wounded on the side of French. No casualties were admitted by the Eversoles. The darkness of the night brought the engagement to a close. French withdrew from town, unquote. A short peace agreement. Throughout the summer of 1877, the forces would meet, would fire upon each other, then withdrew. This went on during the summer months with no clear victor. Both French and Everso almost went bankrupt from paying the men to fight that summer as their businesses began to fail. There was a huge expense paid by each of the sides to keep the standing army ready. Musenberg writes in his book, quote, 
So when the friends of both sides interceded, French and Eversole seemed to be willing to appoint and send representatives to a conference, which was held on Big Creek in Perry County. It was attended by prominent citizens of both Perry and Leslie counties, who were anxious to bring about a settlement of the war, unquote. Both sides sent representatives to the meeting at Big Creek in Perry County, and the written agreements were signed and witnessed. The agreement basically stated that both sides would disarm by surrendering their guns and ammunition, disband their armies, and go home. French surrendered his guns to the county judge of Leslie County, while Everso surrendered his guns to his father-in-law, Judge Josiah Combs of Perry County. Both sides disbanded. There were many on both sides of this conflict that said that the peace accord was nothing more than a piece of paper and that it was worthless. There was no feelings of friendship on either side. The reasons behind the peace accord was for purely financial reasons. Respect for the law, welfare of the country, and the people living in the area took a back seat to those that were involved in the feud. Also the thought that the feelings of distrust and rancor was still among those who participated in the feud, and so it was like a kettle on a stove ready to boil over. The peace accord fell apart pretty quickly as neither of the men were willing to let their grudges against the other go. French accused Everso of taking his guns back from his father-in-law, Judge Josiah Combs. Everso justified his claim that French had not witnessed that happening and was basically calling him a liar. Everso further claimed that French had not disbanded his army and that the deal had only called for a partial surrender of arms. Musenberg writes in his book, quote, Whether or not these reports had been actually brought to the ears of the chieftains or had been invented by them in order to manufacture some sort of pretext upon which to renew hostilities must ever remain in doubt. Future events seem to prove rather clearly that neither of the parties was in very good faith toward keeping the peace. Both French and Everso appeared singularly well prepared to re-enter the war. The ink had hardly dried on the treaty when Perry County was once again thrown into turmoil and strife. What had the authorities been doing during this period of quasi-warfare? We find absolutely no record of any sort of attempt to maintain the dignity of the law, unquote. So now the question becomes, was this peace accord made with good faith after all? Or was this a way to recover from the financial burden that both men were facing because of the hired hands? Whatever the reason may be, we have to agree with Mosenberg that it was not done with the best of intentions. Joseph Eversole versus Bill Gambriel. A heated argument broke out in Hazard, Kentucky between Joseph Eversole and Bill Gambriel on September 15, 1887. We get the description of Gambriel and Eversole from Musenberg's writings. Quote, Gambriel was a minister of the gospel, a typical mountaineer, tall, powerful, and game. He would fight at the drop of a hat and drop the hat himself. It was said of him that he considered moonshine whiskey of much benefit for the stomach and a game of cards an agreeable diversion from the cares and toils of life. It was said of him, too, that he carried a testament in one pocket, a deck of cards, a bottle of liquor, and a pistol in the other. This had been told as in a joke. But straightway, this description of him was accepted as fact and was widely published in the papers at the time." Unquote. The truth of the matter is that he was a man who entertained rather singular, independent, and free ideas of the duties of preacher. He was a good man, and he had a wide circle of friends. Joe Everso was physically a small man of slight stature, but quick and agile as a boy. Certainly, he was fearless. Unquote. There is an old saying in the mountains that mountain men are either preachers or horse thieves. This is to mean that there are two types of hardy men of the mountains, those that are gentle and church-going and those that love to raise a ruckus. By the sound of it, Bill Gambriel was a little of both. We get a pretty interesting picture of how the fight ended for Musenberg. Hang on to your hat because it gets pretty descriptive. Quote, After a short exchange of blows between the men, 
Gambriel was fired upon by secreted friends of Everso. Attempting to escape by running around the house, Gambriel was fired upon from another quarter and fatally wounded. Staggering and reeling, he turned upon Everso, who fired into his head, instantly killing him, unquote. Was the shooting of Gambriel fair and on the up and up? That would be a question that would not only see the inside of a courtroom, but would also be put into a report for the governor of the state of Kentucky. We will let you decide if justice was served or if it was denied in this case. Several men would be indicted for murder of Bill Gambriel, but only one man was tried in a court of law. The first trial had a hung jury and the second trial acquitted him. The open secret of Hazard at that time was that the man who shot him and gave him the fatal wound was a police officer. Even though Joseph Eversoll was the man who killed Gambriel by shooting him in the head, he had not been arrested or faced charges because there was a witness that said that Gambriel attacked him first. There was an official report made to the governor of the state of Kentucky regarding this fight. In the report, it states that Eversoll had started the fight and killed Gambriel. According to another source, French and his faction insisted that Eversoll be charged for the shooting and murder of Gambriel. Eversoll's forces insisted that Gambriel pulled out a gun and that Eversoll was shooting back at Gambriel in self-defense. Judge Combs refused to issue a warrant out for the arrest of Eversoll on those grounds. Call us a little skeptical here. What was the argument over between Eversoll and Gambriel? Why did the men shoot at Bill Gambriel? Was he winning the scuffle between him and Eversoll? While Gambriel was trying to get away, why did Eversoll feel that he needed to kill him? Why was Eversoll never charged for murder? Was it because Judge Combs was his father-in-law? Why was a second man charged for killing Bill Gambriel instead of Eversoll, and who was he? The killing of Gambriel left a sour taste in everyone's mouths because Gambriel was a very well-liked traveling preacher who had many friends. French took his death very hard because they were great friends and Gambriel had been such a staunch supporter for his factions. Even the Eversoles knew that his death would not go unanswered and they were taking every precaution to protect themselves. For now, we will leave the French Eversole feud with the death of Gambriel. The Eversole faction had successfully made their way through the court system and was acquitted of all the charges. The French side was very angry by the death and was now starting to plan. A Winter Ceasefire While not an official ceasefire, as like with the last failed attempt, the Eversole and French did disband for a short time during the winter months of 1887 through 1888. As soon as the weather broke, however, they once again formed into their different armies. Both sides would wander the thick wooded areas to defy the law and terrorize the inhabitants of Hazard and surrounding Perry County. We get a sense of how the residents of Perry County was feeling from the newspaper reports of the time. That gave us a picture of what they saw going on between the two factions. Rosenberg states in his book the following, quote, but little fighting was done. It seems that they contented themselves with maneuvering, marching, and countermarching. In such warfare, if warfare it was, the innocent were made to suffer more than the warriors. Such an armed vagabondage was useless as it was silly. It furnished material for the sensational newspaper. But even these failed to discover anything of the heroic about this campaign. The leaders must have felt something of that themselves. For during the winter, the armies were again disbanded. Permanent restoration of peace, however, was not to come to Perry County yet for a time, unquote. It seems that the men would take advantage of the worn breaks of the weather to either march around in formation or terrorize the inhabitants of the area. Only the snowstorms of the mountains winter seems to make the men go home to their families and stay indoors. The Deaths of Joseph Castle Eversole and Nick Combs On Sunday, April 15, 1888, would be a day that would strike fear and horror among the residents of Perry County. In the valley of the Big Creek, Perry County, Kentucky, would be a scene of murder. 
we shall let Muzenberg set the scene. Quote, the valley is narrow. The hills enclosing it are steep, rugged, and covered with dense forest. The spot where the murderers were in hiding commanded an uninterrupted view of the road up and down the valley. Nothing short of a lynx's eyes could have penetrated the leafy, thicket-grown murderer's retreat. On the day of the murder, Joe Everso, in the company of his father-in-law, Judge Josiah Combs, and the latter's youthful nephew, Nick Combs, bade a last farewell to his family and a host of friends at Hazard, and started for Hyden, where the regular term of the circuit court was scheduled to begin the following morning. This court, Eversoul and Judge Combs had always attended, having been practicing members of the bar there for some years. Of this fact, the assassins had been well informed, unquote. It seems that the killers were well informed about the movements of their quarry. It is thought that the men lying in wait had been in their spots for at least a day or longer. They were rewarded with their grisly task that laid before them. While traveling to court in Hyden, Judge Combs, Joseph Eversoll, and Nick Combs were joined on their journey by Tom Hollyfield, an officer of the law, and his prisoner, Mary Jones. Judge Combs rode with Hollyfield and Jones, and Eversoll and Combs were far behind them. This was purely by chance that Judge Combs was ahead of the family members. The slayers allowed their cord to pass 40 yards or more beyond them before they opened fire. The sounds of multiple gunshots rang through the air, echoing off the mountains. Judge Combs turned around and witnessed Joseph and Nick fall from their rearing and plunging horses. They struggled for just a moment before they were still. Nick Combs had fainted and was revived when one of the assassins came near him. Nick begged for the man not to shoot him any more because he was already dying. The man said, quote, dead man tell no tales, unquote. This scene only lasted long enough for the man to raise his rifle and finish the job by shooting Nick Combs in the head. The man coldly then went to the body of Everso and emptied his pockets and left the scene of the crime. After witnessing all that had happened, Judge Combs filled with shock and horror came to his senses and spurred on his horse to hide in to get help. The shots had been heard from a house that was located 300 yards from the crime scene. The owner of the house, a man named Fields, and a man named Campbell came running to find out what had happened. As expected, Nick Combs and Joseph Eversoll were still laying in the road where they fell. Eversoll's pockets had been turned inside out. Nick Combs' horse was found shot in the middle of a meadow by the side of the road, a short distance from the crime scene. Eversoll's horse was found and caught several miles down the road by a stream. Investigation This scene so disturbed the people of the area that an immediate investigation was underway. A posse was quickly formed and started on the trail of those that were participants in the crime. It was not long before the place where the sniper's nest had been was found. It was located 61 feet from the point where Combs and Everso had lain in the road. The sniper's nest was found to be located in a thick spruce pine thicket. Several of the bushes from the pine trees had been tied together and bent over to form a complete screen and shelter for the men who were there. They could not have been seen by anyone who passed by that spot. Behind the screen, a natural depression in the earth was found that would serve as a rifle pit. It had been filled with leaves and was trodden down to make the men more invisible to anyone who passed by. There were several plainly visible footprints all around the area. It is thought that this place had been used for at least two days as there were remnants of mills there. The trail behind this nest went up the mountain and split off into three different directions. One path led up to the top of the mountain where there was a ridge that could be used to watch for quarry coming into the area. The other two paths divided one to the right and one to the left. It was guessed that there had to be at least three men. According to Musenberg, quote, When this fact became known to the pursuers' retreat, seemingly afraid of an ambush, 
They reason that three or more men so desperate as to commit a cold-blooded double murder in the broad open light of day, almost in sight of human habitation, would and could in this wild mountain region successfully fight even larger force than at the command of the pursuers." Unquote. The bodies of Combs and Everso were taken to Hazard, Kentucky that afternoon and buried. There was a great number of people who came to the burials. The Head of a Snake There is an old saying in the mountains that if you want to stop a fight, you have to go after the head of the snake. The French faction of the feud thought that they had accomplished that goal. However, they would very soon learn that it was not the case at all. Several members of the faction were openly charged with the responsibility for the murders of Combs and Eversoul. Benjamin French was indicted for the killings. French feared for his life, and so he surrounded himself with armed men. He immediately withdrew from the town of Hazard and took to the woods. The Eversoul faction did not die with its leader. A very brave and cautious man by the name of John Campbell would take over as the new leader of the group of men. Even though Joseph Eversoul was killed with Nick Combs, the French and Eversoul feud was still continuing. The Leadership of John Campbell With the absence of the French faction, John Campbell went to work making sure that Hazard was safe. He surrounded the town with armed guards. Squads of men patrolled the streets and other men scouted the mountains in the area. Only those that knew the password could come into town. Those that attempted to get past the guards was met with a barrage of bullets hurled their way. Campbell was expecting an attack from the French faction any day now. He therefore believed that military methods should be deployed for the safety of the faction. Shade Combs Shade Combs came to John Campbell one day and asked for permission to ambush and kill certain members of the French faction. Campbell not only gave his permission, but also furnished him men to accomplish the task. Somehow, the men who were targeted got wind of the plot to end their lives. They stopped the plot by making the hunter now the hunted. Combs was able to escape death in the mountains. However, this would not be for long. One morning, while saddling his horse at his home, Combs was ambushed, shot, and died. The Death of John Campbell Perhaps it was due to his overactive, cautious nature that led to Campbell's death. Perhaps it was the overdrilling of the men with the order to shoot to kill anyone who did not have a password. Either way, his death was attributed to his own actions. Here's what happened. John Campbell was returning from a scouting expedition late one night. He noticed a sentry that was asleep on duty. He shouted for the sentry to rise. Upon doing so, half asleep, the sentry put his rifle to his shoulder and fired. John Campbell crumpled to the ground with a groan. The sentry realized that he had made a mistake and gave the alarm. Campbell was immediately taken to his home where the surgeon told everyone that his wounds were fatal. Campbell lingered for 30 days in agony until he finally passed away. Elijah Morgan Elijah Morgan was also the son-in-law to Judge Josiah Combs. He went against the family and was a French supporter. This made him a lot of enemies. His death had been marked by the Eversol faction for some time. However, because he was very shrewd, and had knowledge about the tactics that his enemy was using, he was able to sidestep ambushes and attacks. Previous to his death, Morgan had stated a desire for peace with his extended family members. He expressed the desire to lay down his arms and be permitted to live out his days in peace. Knowing this, the Everso faction came up with a ruse. The Everso faction assured Morgan that they also wished to be on great terms with him. They wanted to make an accord with him and told him that he could come to Hazard, Kentucky for that purpose. They promised Morgan that they would not harm him as he came into town on October 9, 1888 and that he would have the freedom of movement in the town. 
With these assurances, Morgan agreed to come to town to make the accord. Every effort was made to make sure that Morgan had no clue of the plot that would soon unfold. Snipers were placed at different points along Morgan's route to Hazard from his home, and several were placed at convenient spots in Hazard Township. Not seeing any trouble, Morgan and Frank Grace made their way to Hazard, Kentucky for the meeting. The account of the shooting is given by Musenberg. Quote, within less than two miles, in fact, little more than a mile from town, at a spot where the road is flanked by a large overhanging cliffs on one side and the steep river bank on the other, Morgan was fired upon. A number of shots followed the first one. Grace was driven to cover. Morgan, in his death struggle, rolled over the river bank where a small tree arrested further descent. Grace, not daring to abandon his place of comparative safety, remained a helpless spectator of the agonies of his dying friend. Country people, traveling toward town, at last came to Morgan's relief, but he died within a few hours, unquote. The alarm went out, a posse was formed, but none of the men who were shooting at Morgan and Grace were ever discovered. The Call for Justice once again, the people of Perry County were shocked at the shooting of someone in the small community. The death of Elijah Morgan did not go over very well. The French faction openly charged the Everso faction of murder. The Everso faction expressed exasperation and resentment at this charge. The Everso faction claimed that the French faction had no right for such outrage. After all, the Eversoles claimed that they had brought charges against the French faction for murders and nothing came of them. The murder of Morgan came on the heels of the murder of Shade Combs. It is widely believed that Morgan was killed in retaliation for the death of Combs. Circuit Judge Lilly tried to inspire the district with respect for his court, but this failed. This had gotten so bad in the counties of Breathitt, Letcher, Perry, Knott, and surrounding counties that Judge Lilly ordered troops of 45 state guards into Perry County to guard the court. The troops arrived in November of 1888 to help Lilly conduct the court. Lilly wrote a plea to the governor of the state of Kentucky for more troops to restore order. The following letter and response can be found in the book Kentucky's Famous Feuds and Tragedies. Quote, Hazard, Kentucky, November 13, 1888. To the Governor of Kentucky. Sir, Captain Sohan has succeeded in organizing a company of 45 state guards in Perry County. He informs me that he has no orders and does not know whether he will be ordered back to Louisville or go with me to Whitesburg, thence to Hindman, and thence to Breathitt but in any event, expects to be ordered away from here very soon. Mr. B.F. French is here with 15 or perhaps more men, well armed, and the people are so much alarmed, fearing that they will be left to the mercy of these men, that I have decided that I will take the responsibility upon myself to order the Perry County Guards on duty, hoping that you will approve my actions and order them on duty, and let their pay begin on the 17th instant. I will not attempt to hold courts at Letcher, Knott, or Breathitt unless you send guards along. No good can be accomplished by holding courts in any of these counties without a guard. If a sufficient guard is present, I think that much good would be accomplished in and by the moral effect it will have on the people by showing them that you are determined to have the courts held and the laws enforced and to give protection to the good citizens. Please write me and send by the way of Manchester, as I shall return that way, and if I do not receive your letter here, can get it on the road. If you order the guard to go with me, I will go, and hold the courts if not provincially hindered. I remain truly yours, H. C. Lilly. After the first set of troops had arrived in Perry County, Sam Hill, a state guard wrote Governor Buckner on November 14, 1888. In this letter, he said only 35 people remained in the town when he arrived. Many came back, though, when they saw the troops were now in town. Governor Buckner's reply to Judge Lilly. Governor Buckner's reply, Executive Department, Frankfurt, November 27, 1888, 
Honorable H.C. Lilly, Judge, Irvine, Kentucky. Dear Sir, I have the honor to acknowledge the receipt of your communication of the 13th instant from Hazard, Perry County, in which you say, quote, Mr. B.F. French is here with 15 or perhaps more men well armed, and the people are so much alarmed, fearing that they will be left to the mercy of those men, that I have decided that I will take the responsibility upon myself to order the Perry County Guards on duty, hoping that you will approve my actions and order them on duty, and let their pay begin on the 17th instant, unquote. At the time I received your communication, I was in communication with the sheriff of Perry County. I inferred from his statements that there was no immediate danger of an outbreak or opposition to the civil authorities, and second, but a slight effort has been made by him to arrest violators of the law. Your own statement does not inform me of anything more than a vague apprehension in the public mind and does not advise me that the civil authorities cannot suppress any attempts at the disturbance by employing the usual force of civil government. I assume that if danger had been imminent, both you and the sheriff would have remained on the ground. The object of furnishing troops on your application was to protect the court in the discharge of its duties and not to supersede the civil authorities by military force. Under the circumstances, I do not feel authorized to call the local militia into active service. Respectfully, your obedient servant, S.B. Buckner. Even though Governor Buckner basically called the residents of Hazard, Kentucky cowards for not taking control of the situation, one has to wonder if he truly understood the gravity of the situation. Those who were not taken aside with one faction or the other still feared for their lives. There was a real unease that an ambush or shooting could happen without warning. With the help of the troops, the Perry County Court term of November 1888 was mostly peaceful. Law and order seemed to be restored once again to Perry County. Because of the thought that the law had once again been obtained in the area, the troops were withdrawn for the next court term. This would be a terrible mistake, as the Battle of Hazard, Kentucky, would soon take place. The Replacement of Judge Lilly As we have seen, Judge Lilly had written a letter to Governor S.B. Buckner for the help with the situation in Perry County. Perry County had split into two violent factions, and the residents of Hazard feared for their very lives. The death of Elijah Morgan stirred up more unease in the county, as the Eversol faction had sealed up Hazard, Kentucky, and barred the entry of anyone who did not have the password on pain of death. Judge Lilly secured 45 state guards to Perry County by court order so that the court business could be maintained for the November 1888 session. While the troops were there for a year, order was maintained and the court was allowed to have a peaceful session. During the spring term of 1889, several indictments were handed down against law violators. This would bring them into Judge Lilly's courtroom during the November 1889 session. However, in November of 1889, the troops were recalled and Perry County was once again left to its own devices. Because of the belief that the Home Guards would be able to handle the growing escalation of the threat of violence in Perry County, Judge Lilly refused to appear in his own courtroom under those conditions. A special election was then held, and Honorable W. L. Hurst was seated as the pro tem judge. The Battle of Hazard The following will cover the dates of November 7th and 8th of 1889 in the Perry County Circuit Courtroom. Honorable W. L. Hurst will be presiding. Everything seemed to go very peacefully and quietly as the first three days of court handled unimportant business. The night of the third day of court, however, there was a significant disorder and chaos. On the fourth day of court, before noon of that day, a heavy volley of shots would ring out that cold November morning. It seems that a man named Campbell and his friends were having a wonderful time at a place named Graveyard Hill that overlooked the downtown Hazard community. They were drinking moonshine and having fun playing poker. 
It seems that Campbell decided to add to his fun by standing beside of a tree and shooting his pistol. There was a store at the upper end of Hazard owned by Mr. Davison. As soon as Davison heard the shots being fired, he looked out of the rear window of the store to see Campbell waving around his still smoking pistol in the air. Davison then grabbed his Winchester rifle, took aim, fired, and Campbell fell to the ground dead. These shots were heard in the courtroom during the morning session of court. Everyone fell silent and looked to each other for answers. With an unheard command of stampede, everyone, including the judge, lawyers, jurors, and officials, and bystanders, suddenly got up on their feet and ran for the exits. No one had taken the time to find out what the cause of the great commotion was all about. They just figured that the feud was reignited and it was time to leave town as quickly as possible. The crowd scattered in all directions. There were some that sought protection in the courthouse walls and stairways of the building. Others ran out of town without so much as a word as they hurried on their way. The two factions quickly began to form again, and after the first stampede of human flesh had abated, they began to ascertain on what action they should take next. The Eversoles ran back into the courthouse and took possession of the building. There were two of the French factions still inside of the building on the upper floor by the name of Fields and Prophet. Both men silently locked themselves into the room and weighed their options. They quietly opened one of the windows and decided that if they jumped, it could mean a broken limb, a broken neck, or worse, death. But as soon as the Eversoles started to try to break in the door, they decided their chances and jumped out of the window. Both men landed on the ground without sustaining any injuries. But it was not over for Fields and Prophet, as the Eversoles caught on that the two men had jumped out of the window for their lives. They immediately began to open fire on the two men. They scrambled to the safety of the jailhouse, which was 15 feet away from the courthouse. Both buildings faced the same street. As Musenberg says in his book, quote, The Eversoles now passed their time in ventilating the thin brick walls of the little building. Fields and Prophet began to feel uncomfortably warm, but held the fort. They had an ample supply of ammunition and continued to pour volley upon volley into the windows through the walls of the courthouse. All through the long afternoon, the guns roared. Clouds of smoke hung low and heavy over the unfortunate town. Constant was the clatter of firearms. The incessant hiss of leaden missiles was interspersed with shouts and defiant curses while the silent terror of women and children was a pitiful sight to behold. The whole, presented as a scene, was not easily forgotten by those who were compelled to witness it." Unquote. Although there was ample ammunition that was spent as each side shot the other side, there was not reported injuries or fatalities during this gun battle. Both sides made sure that their bodies were well protected and not accidentally exposed to any gunfire. Any object in a window that was suspected of hiding a human being was shot upon. That night, the two men decided it was far better trying to make a run for safety than to face an overwhelming sneak attack at night. Both men waited for cover of darkness to fall, then kept their heads down upon their chest and made a run for it. Through a gauntlet of flying bullets, as the Eversoles trained all of their guns upon them, the two men ran through the barrage and made it safely to the French faction. When they reached their safe haven, a bunch of hooping and hollering was heard because the Eversoles had been defeated in their cause. French had been out of town while all of this was occurring and had arrived safely at night with his men to join the battle. For the rest of that night, each side continued shooting at each other without an intermission. Sometime during the night, Jesse Fields and Tom Smith evaded gunshots and occupied Graveyard Hill. They saw a sunken grave that had been dug out and used it as a rifle pit and the tombstone Smith used as a place to steady his rifle. They then opened fire upon the courthouse. The occupants of the courthouse instantly hit the wooden floors for safety. As the first rays of dawn began to appear over the mountaintops, two of the Eversoles men attempted to cross the street. Smith and Fields opened fire on the two men. 
Jay McKnight was instantly killed while his companion made it to the other side of the road. Any attempt made by the Eversoles to return fire meant certain death. The Eversole faction soon came to the realization that the very building that they were happy to have soon became a death trap. Furniture was shot to smithereens. Wood casings and shutters were obliterated and shot away from their posts. Feeling like mice caught in a steel trap, they quickly began to formulate a plan of escape. They retreated out of the building and made their way to North Fork, Kentucky River that ran along town. Green Morris and a companion had hid themselves along the river bank to act as fire cover for the escaping ever so faction. It did not take long for Fields and Smith to discover the men running for safety to the river bank. They picked up their guns and gave chase. Approaching the river, Morris and his companion opened fire upon Smith and Fields. Fields was shot in the arm, sustaining severe wounds and thus ending their pursuit of the Eversoles. Sometime that evening, there was an attack upon the acting judge, Honorable W. L. Hurst. It seems that the judge had been shot at, but not wounded, and his house had a stick of dynamite thrown into it, and it blew up. His house was located on the French side of the town. We will leave this section of the feud as the Eversoles are high-telling it across the North Fork of the Kentucky River for safety, and the French side take care of their only wounded man, Fields. More Fighting in Hazard, Kentucky According to the Butler Weekly Times from Butler, Missouri, on September 14, 1889, writes, quote, French ever sold feud is raging, London Depot, Kentucky, September 8th, Hazard, the county seat of Perry, was the scene of Tuesday night of a shooting melee. The French ever sold feud has broken loose again. Early in the day, the Eversoles and McCombs gathered in town and later came the Frenches and the Fieldses, and the two factions managed to keep apart until night, when the clash came. Both sides lined up, and only the darkness prevented greater killing than what was done. Phil McCombs was killed by Fields. Several on both sides were wounded. Then both factions retired. Perry is one of the wildest counties in the mountains, being two counties further back than Clay, and contains the gamest of game fighters. Hazard, the largest town in the county, has a population of 79. More killing is looked for, unquote. So whether or not this is speaking about the Battle of Hazard, Kentucky, or of another major conflict between the two sides, we are unsure of. However, we are reporting as we find information in the newspapers and other documents. It is up to you, our viewer, to decide upon the matter. The Burning of the Courthouse the court did try to hold a special term in August of 1890. However, on the night of July 4, 1890, there was a scream heard in the night of fire. The sound of falling, crashing, crackling timbers filled the air. The smell of smoke is heavy in the mountains. As the horror of the realization of the Perry County Courthouse was being destroyed by the fire. There was not anything that the residents could do to save their bastion of justice as the building fell to the flames. It was very quickly determined that the cause of the fire had been the use of dynamite. However, fortunately, most of the records were saved from destruction. This put a true explanation point to the end of the court business for 1890. Pro Tem Judge W. L. Hurt's Letter To most people, the reasons that Honorable W. L. Hurst writes in the following document seems to be both valid and reasonable given the circumstances. The document can be found in the book Kentucky's Famous Feuds and Tragedies. Quote, Perry Circuit Court, 4th day of November, term 1889. At this term of the court, there are two armed factions in the town of Hazard, the French and Eversole factions antagonistic to each other. On the second night of court, the acting judge was shot but not wounded in the French end of the town. French not being in the town at the time, but some of his men were, and the next evening at dusk, a dynamite or other cartridge with a burning fuse attached was thrown over the judge's room or house in which he stayed, and it exploded heavily on the other side of the house. Court continued until the evening of the fourth day. 
when the two factions began heavily cross-firing at each other in earnest about near the courthouse which completely corralled the court the jury and officers and people in the court for some time and before the firing abated the judge plainly seeing that it was not intended that the court should be further held and it being impossible to further progress with business and live the court ordered the clerk to adjourn the court and the non-combatants to save themselves as best they could they did so but one shot was fired at them from the ever so quarters as they left the fighting continued through the next night and until about nine o'clock the next day excepting some intervals of rest the french side received reinforcements from breathitt county during this fight two men friends of eversoles were killed in the battle and it was rumored that one of the french party was badly wounded and perhaps killed another one was wounded the Everso party claimed that they were destitute of ammunition the next morning and retired from town without being injured thereby the clerk left with his keys the jury left and the judge remained till the next morning in town and after the retreat of the Everso party when he received news as coming from the french side that he and the women and children could leave the town unmolested provided that he did not go back to the courthouse whereupon the court and some of the women and commonwealth's attorney quietly marched away in pursuance to the court's orders this court is hereby adjourned in its course this order was signed at the august special term of the court eighteen ninety and the eleventh day of august eighteen ninety Unquote. as you can see this was more than reasonable to close the court sessions down for the year it was obvious that both sides of the conflict was not about to let the court hold its business and even though the courthouse was no longer standing many threats were made against the judge and members of the court if they dared to try to hold any type of sessions robin cornett both sides were starting to get very bored of just scouting the mountains and occasional ambushes they were wanting to either fight or go home robin cornett on the side of the eversoles was one of the men that just wanted to give up and go home the mountain many skirmishes had lost their appeal several men noticed this change in cornett and decided to become friends with him and day after day he would tend to his home and do business in hazard without the slightest provocation of trouble after a while of seemingly peace cornett began to let his guard down and relax his vigilance this was a deadly mistake one morning in july eighteen ninety cornett and his little brother went to the field to cut oats since they were not ripe yet he decided to go into the woods to peel logs one of the trees that he had felled was laying across a narrow ravine several places in the tree were hovering several feet up into the air with an axe in his hand he leaped upon the felled tree shots rang out in the mountain air as cornet was struck and slumped down on the tree dead his little brother ran for his life to get help and safety cornet's death marked another planned death that was executed with precision this seems to be a hallmark of this feud and cornet's death makes the second death that had an elaborate plot twist of feigned peace to lure in the victim the court's response to the battle of hazard circuit court judge lilly adjutant general gaithers of louisville kentucky along with a detachment of state guards went to hazard kentucky to hold a special term of the circuit court a large tent was raised to serve as a court building as the courthouse had not been rebuilt from the ashes this would be known as a blanket court both because it was held in a tent and for what would happen next the first order of business was to replace the home guards with a large number of sworn deputy sheriffs the home guards had been inefficient in their duties to keep peace in the city and surrounding counties they were ordered to return their equipment that had been issued to them by the court however what little guns and other articles were returned were broken and no longer usable according to the newspaper the climax from richmond kentucky dated september third eighteen ninety Quote, 23 men engaged in the French Everso feud have been indicted for the murder and accessory, and many of them have been arrested. The grand jury was reluctant to bring in the indictments. 
but were called upon in court by the prosecuting attorney who told them they must do their duty or he would discharge them and call another jury. Judge Lilly added to the statement that if they sought to protect the lawbreakers, he would refuse to sign their warrants for pay, unquote. Court in Session Judge Lilly meant business. As soon as the indictments were found, the people were rounded up and taken into the jail. It became so crowded that a second tent was erected and heavily guarded to keep the prisoners. As soon as the cases were brought before the judge, they were transferred to Clark County Circuit Court for trial and housed in the Winchester Jail. This was done because it was believed that there could not be a jury in Perry County or any of the surrounding counties that would be fair and just in their decisions. And it was also given that the family and friends of the accused would attend court and cause chaos defending their loved ones. Peace in the Mountains for a while, it was thought that all of the troublemakers of the feud had been arrested and were now facing charges in Clark County, Kentucky. Both factions were now awaiting trial for their actions. For the first couple of days, there were arguments and ugly words hurled to the other faction through the bars of the jail. There were even cases of a few fights that went on inside of the jailhouse. These were quickly stopped and the offending prisoners were separated from each other. After a time, while awaiting trial, the prisoners in the jail had a strange calm about them, as they would be feet from each other, and without their guns, there was no courage. Everyone soon realized that this was not solving anything, and began thinking of how to defeat their common enemy, the court of law. It seemed that the bloodlust had abated, and the flared tempers of the men had calmed into a deep reflection. Many feared that the gallows loomed over them as they awaited their turn before the court. So by the time the trial started in Clay County, a strange event took place. Those that were the bitterest of enemies were actually testifying for each other. The most deadly of enemies were now best of friends. This tragedy began to clog the wheels of justice. As men who were previously not allowed to have bail suddenly found themselves able to post it and leave to go home to their families, some of whom they had not seen in weeks or months. According to the semi-weekly interior journal from Stanford, Kentucky on October 10, 1893, it was reported the following, quote, all of the cases growing out of the French Eversole feud in Perry County transferred by the legislature to Clark County had been filed away on condition that the participants go and send no more, unquote. The two factions face off. The tensions in the county had not eased, even though that there was peace. This account comes from the Cooperstown, Griggs County, North Dakota, Griggs Courier on May 26, 1893. Quote, Fatal factional fight. The French Eversole feud in Kentucky ends in bloodshed. London, Kentucky, May 22nd. The noted French Eversole feud has broken out afresh. In a fight on the streets of Hazard Wednesday between Cash and John Everso, leaders on one side, and Jesse Fields, leader of the French faction, Jesse Hale was instantly killed. Jesse Fields was wounded in the back and arm. John Everso was shot in the wrist, and Polly Ann Combs, grandmother of the Eversos, was seriously wounded. The fight was ferocious and a bloody one, unquote. More fighting. According to the Daily Public Ledger from Maysville, Kentucky, on November 9, 1899, it was stated, quote, Feudus going armed, London, Kentucky, November 9th. The French Eversole feud in Perry County has broken out again. John Eversole killed John Davis Monday, and both sides are now carrying Winchesters. A battle is expected momentarily. Enoch Jackson killed Lish Smith on Otter Creek, Clay County, Monday. Dan Parker, who was acquitted of killing A.C. Turner last week at Manchester, was fired on by a mob of unknown parties believed to be Turner. Fifty shots were fired into Parker's house, unquote. The Street Fight there is not a lot of information in the newspapers or in the book about the street fight that took place in 1894. 
other than that it took place in Hazard, Kentucky. The participants of some of the Eversole faction against Jesse Fields, who was part of the French faction. There was a gun battle, and some of the Eversole's men and Fields were wounded. There was a fatal shot from a stray bullet that killed an innocent African-American bystander. It is thought that the street fight came about as a direct result from the tensions from the feud itself and not the cause of the feud reigniting. The feud is not over by a long shot yet. There still would be ambushes, fightings, duels, and other things going on while the feud was peaceful, but these things did not restart the feud. It will be Judge Combs' murder in 1894 that once again lit the fuse. Who was Judge Josiah Combs? Josiah Henry Combs was born on November 25, 1832 at Hazard in Perry County, Kentucky to Jesse and Mary Polly Bowling Combs. Jesse was a former clerk of Perry County and was the grandson of Elijah Combs, the founder of Hazard and Perry County. Josiah would marry Elizabeth Polly Ann Mattingly on July 9, 1853 in Hazard, Kentucky. Their children were William Jesse Combs, 1853 to 1938, Nancy Combs, Susan Combs, 1857 to 1947, Susan would marry Joseph C. Eversole, Sarah Combs, 1857 to 1919, Sarah would marry Elijah Morgan, who was a French supporter, Martha Combs, 1859 to 1886, Martha would marry Jess Davison, the second leader of the Eversole faction, and Mary Ellen Combs, 1860-1900. Torn between family and duty. The Combs family was mainly on the side of the Eversoles and the French Eversole feud, with the exception of Sarah and Elijah Morgan. This conflict in his family would show up in the courtroom. The conflict came on February 15, 1887, when Judge Combs' son-in-law, Joseph C. Eversole, would get into a fight with William Bill Gambrell, who would be shot and killed by Eversole. On the grounds of self-defense, Combs refused to press the charges of murder against his son-in-law. With this action, Combs became a participant in the feud, and for safety reasons, he had to leave Perry County with his family. Return to Perry County After four years of uneasy peace, Judge Combs and his family returned to Perry County. This was done over the objection of his close friends. However, Combs wanted to spend his remaining years in hazard in peace and quiet. Every mountain person, no matter how far away they may roam, has a piece of the Appalachians forever in their hearts, and they are not satisfied anywhere on the planet until they set their feet upon that ground once again. It is said that the Appalachian Mountains always call her children home to her, no matter how far or where they travel to on the earth. Such was the case for Judge Combs. Because Hazard was home to him, he would not hear of not returning to the very spot he loved so very much. Narrow Escape Before returning to Perry County on a permanent basis, Judge Combs would come into the area to visit his friends and loved ones. Because of his participation in the feud, he was a marked man by the French faction. On one such visit to the area, there was an assassination attempt upon his life. According to the newspaper account, there were two such attempts made. He was able to escape without harm, but it should have stood as a warning to Judge Combs that he was a marked person for death if he had tried to stay in the area. Undaunted or unwilling to bend to the threat against his life, Judge Combs decided to move to the area regardless. It is curious that Judge Combs was with Joseph C. Eversole and Nick Combs when they were shot dead in an ambush while traveling to Hyman, Kentucky for court. The lucky circumstance as to why Judge Combs was not also shot had to be because he was ahead of the pair with Tom Hollyfield, an officer of the law, and his prisoner, Mary Jones. Finding out that Judge Combs was once again in the area, the French faction decided to even the score with Judge Combs as he refused to prosecute Joseph C. Eversole. 
even though Eversol was now dead and Combs was no longer participating in the feud anymore. Death of Judge Josiah Combs The following is a retelling of the death of Judge Josiah Henry Combs as told in the book Kentucky's Famous Feuds and Tragedies. Judge Combs had moved back to Perry County and had a farm. On September 23, 1894, he was growing corn that was about as thick and tall as the rest of the weeds and underbrush that surrounded his land. This gave perfect cover to those who wished to ambush anyone, and it gave them ample opportunity to get within just a few feet of their potential quarry without fear of being discovered. About 7 a.m. that morning, a group of friends and neighbors were having a conversation with Judge Combs. It is unclear if he was on the road or out in his yard when the shots rang out. What is clear is that after the shots rang out, that he reeled from the deadly shot, straightened himself back up, walked across the road to his home, and fell to the ground at his threshold and died on that very spot. It is thought that the person who fired the shot followed the judge with the side of his gun pointed at the man as he made his way to his home in case the shot proved not to be fatal. Upon seeing the death of the judge, the assassin made his way to the end of the lot where he was met by another confederate. There was a third person who also began firing shots from across the river. It is thought that the purpose for this was to make everyone think that there was a large party involved so that the posse would not pursue them any further. The three men made their way purposefully and calmly down the river with no fear shown that they would be followed. The manner in which they conducted themselves confused the town people. After the assassins had a huge start, was a posse formed to give pursuit. Once the posse caught up to the outlaws, a running gun battle began and one of the confederates was shot and wounded. A member of the posse was also wounded in the gun battle. However, the outlaws slipped into the thick wooded area of the mountains and vanished, so the pursuit had to end. Judge Josiah Combs' death in the newspapers According to the Daily Public Ledger from Maysville, Kentucky on September 27, 1894, French Eversold feud, another victim in the person of Judge J. C. Combs, who was assassinated, Pineville, Kentucky, September 27th. The famous French Eversold feud has been revived. Letters received here Wednesday morning announced that Judge J. H. Combs, father-in-law of J. C. Eversold, was shot down and killed at his home at Hazard, Perry County, on last Sunday morning at 7 o'clock. The assassin was hiding in a patch of corn across the village road from the judge's house. Judge Combs was in his yard talking to friends when the shot was fired. The bullet struck him in the heart. Judge Combs was 65 years old. He had been generally liked. Two attempts were made to assassinate Judge Combs last year, but they were unsuccessful. It is probable that this murder will start the feud afresh. Perry County is remote from railroad and telegraph lines. The French Eversold feud from the first to the last has cost over 30 lives. According to the San Antonio Daily Light from San Antonio, Texas on October 17, 1894. Wednesday, October 17, 1894. We broke out fresh the French Eversold feud again. Rifle cracked. Judge Combs bites the dust. Some of the FFVs of Virginia proceeding to kill each other off. Big Stone Gap, Virginia, October 17th. The French Eversold feud has started afresh in Perry County. Bob May, ex-member of the Kentucky Legislature and one of the principals of the Eversold side, is here from Hazard, the seat of the county war. Judge Josiah Combs, father-in-law of the dead Eversold leader, is dead. The leader of the French faction, whose name was Frazier Fulton French, and two others of his faction have been arrested for his murder, and more arrests will follow. Judge Combs was 50 years old and lived at Hazard. Early on Sunday morning two weeks ago, he stepped across the street where a young Cash Eversole and two others were talking. A rifle cracked from the cornfield just over the fence, and a bullet struck the old man in the breast, and he fell. 
Cash ever so wheeled and saw the man with a blackened face spring up and dash through the cornfield. He says the man was Joe Atkins. At the same time, others of the French gang began firing and shouting from the other direction to divert attention from Atkins. Young Cash with several others ran across the little spur and hid themselves in a ravine. Three men with blackened faces soon appeared who, they ever so said, were Atkins, Frazier, and Jesse Fields. As they climbed over the bank, Will Martin, a boy in the Everso crowd, fired and killed Frazier. The other two escaped, but were captured later. Atkins is said to have escaped, but French and Fields were held. They are trying to get the county judge to come to Breathitt County Line, and they were afraid to go to Hazard. Only last night they received an anonymous letter saying that they would be shot the moment they put a foot across the county line. Judge Combs died in a few hours. He had never taken part in the feud, though he was a man of wealth and in sympathy with the Eversoles, and he always tried to get the French to trial. It was his influence that was feared. Atkins was a noted desperado. More than 30 men have been killed in the feud in the last half dozen years. The Three Confederates Charged with Murder The three accused men of the assassination of Judge Josiah Combs were Joe Atkins, Jesse Fields, and Boone Frazier. It is believed that Joe Atkins is the man who fired the fatal shot from the cornfield. They were found and indicted, with Atkins and Fields being arrested and sent to another county to face trial. Frazier was never caught. Fields and Atkins Both Jesse Fields and Joseph Atkins have been trusted and loyal men for the French faction during the entire feud. They were considered to be lieutenants of French. Because of their close association with the French faction, it was thought that the assassination of Judge Combs could not take place without the blessing of French himself. However, French denied any such connection to the plot or murder of Combs. The First Trial The Honorable William Campbell Preston Breckenridge would be retained as a lawyer for the defense. He was a prominent attorney at the time and very well known and respected for his talent as an attorney as well as an orator for the United States. He served as a Democrat in the U.S. House of Representatives from 1885 to 1895. He was the first cousin of Vice President John C. Breckinridge. The trial would begin on Monday, December 10, 1894 in Judge Hall's courtroom in Hazard, Kentucky. Present at the court were two defendants, Atkins and Fields, but Frazier was not present. All would not go as planned. According to the Hartford Republican in Hartford, Kentucky, December 14, 1894, quote, Lawless in Kentucky. On Monday, Circuit Judge Hall was holding court at Hazard, Perry County, and the first case was the Commonwealth against Jesse Fields and Joe Atkins, friends of the French gang and the French ever so feud. Three months ago, Fields and Atkins murdered an old man named Combs and were held over under $2,000 each, which they executed. They came into trial on Monday heavily armed and had many friends in the courthouse also armed. Fields told the judge when he took the stand that they were not going to jail and that they would kill the sheriff first. The trial proceeded and the judge told the men that they must go to jail and ordered the sheriff to take them. Fields drew his pistol and fired at Judge Hall. The judge ran and several court officers caught Fields and prevented his shooting again. The two desperados left the courthouse and when on the outside, fired several shots into the house, fatally wounding an ever so. They laid in a supply of whiskey and went off into the hills, unquote. There is nothing that we could find stating that Judge Hall was wounded in this shooting attempt. However, we can surmise that when Fields began shooting, people scattered. Thankfully, more people were not shot in the chaos as the court officers had taken hold of Fields and he was not able to do more shooting in the courthouse. But we don't have any information on how Fields was able to escape their grasp and leave. Troops in Hazard 
Kentucky Governor John Y. Brown would swiftly send troops to settle down the area. This is taken from several newspaper articles, including from the Morning News from Savannah, Georgia, December 15, 1894, The Times, Richmond, Virginia, December 15, 1894, and The News and Observer, Raleigh, North Carolina, December 15, 1894. Quote, Troops ordered to hazard. The French ever so war breaks out again in Kentucky. Frankfort, Kentucky, December 14th. Governor Brown has ordered Colonel E. N. Gaither of the 2nd Kentucky Regiment to repair to hazard, Perry County, where the French ever so war has broken out again. The governor is in constant telegraph communication with the scene of the trouble. The trouble grows out of the shooting in the courthouse when Judge Hall narrowly escaped being killed. Jesse Fields and Joe Atkins, who caused the trouble in the courtroom, are still in the mountains and are armed to the teeth. Lexington, Kentucky, December 14th, 11.30 p.m. A telegram received here tonight states that the story of the trouble in Judge Floyd Hall's court in Perry County has started by a Lexington patent machine vendor. It says that Judge Hall was conducting court at Hazard and that Joseph Atkins and Jesse Fields, charged with the murder of X County Judge Combs, were released on bond, unquote. The court would transfer their case to the court in Barbersville, Kentucky. It was felt that this would be a safer option to keep down the atmosphere as it was once again building in lawlessness in Perry County. And, as an added precaution, troops would be summoned to guard the safety of the court in Hazard, Kentucky. We also have no more information as to who the Lexington patent machine vendor was or how he started the fight in the courtroom. Trial in Barbersville, Kentucky and the prosecution witnesses. There would be two significant testimonies that would be presented to the court. The first one is the testimony of Mrs. Susan Everso, the widow of Joseph C. Everso. According to the Paducah Daily Sun, Paducah, Kentucky, on December 23, 1896, quote, saw the shot fired by Joe Atkins that killed her father. Barbersville, Kentucky, December 23rd. In the case of the Commonwealth versus Joe Atkins yesterday, Mrs. Susan Everso, wife of Joe Everso, was called to the witness stand. Mrs. Everso says that she was standing at her father's front door and heard the shot that killed him. She looked in the direction where her father was standing, about 30 yards away, and I saw Joe Atkins with a gun presented in the direction of her father. His face was black like a coal miner. She went to her father and caught the blood from the wound, which she held in her hand, and said, quote, Joe, you have killed my father. Don't shoot any more, While the testimony of Mrs. Everso was going on, people in the courthouse wept. The Commonwealth closed their testimony at 10.30, and the defense asked until 1 p.m. to consult, unquote. According to the semi-weekly Interior Journal dated December 25, 1896, quote, Mrs. Joe Everso testified at Barbersfield that she saw Joe Atkins shoot her father, Judge Combs, unquote. Her testimony must have been terrible for the defense attorneys to ask for a recess to confer with their clients, but her testimony would not be the worst of it. The Confession of Tom Smith while the newspaper clipping of Tom Smith's trial is very extensive, we will dive more into what it says in the story of the bloody breath at war. We will only cover the part of his confession concerning the assassination of Judge Josiah Combs. Several newspapers covered the trial, conviction, and confession of Tom Smith. However, we are taking this snippet from the News Herald of Hillsboro, High County, Ohio, on July 4, 1895. It is believed that since Tom Smith knew that he was going to the gallows, he wanted to meet the hereafter with a clean slate and a clear soul. Quote, John Atkins and I lit out for Joe Everso, and Joe shot him and Nick Combs. I shot at them as they fell, and then robbed Everso's body of $30. John McKnight was the next man I killed. I shot him in the fight at Hazard. Bob Brothers was also shooting at him at the time, and it may be he that killed him. 
Jack Combs and I killed Robert Cornell next. He was cutting saw logs when I came upon him. I shot first. We killed him because he belonged to the Eversoles. I was at Jesse Fields and heard Fulch French, Joe Atkins, Boone Frazier, Mrs. Fields, and Jesse Thorpe make the plot to kill Judge Josiah Combs. And afterward heard Atkins say that he fired the shot that killed him. French offered me money, but I never hired to him. Yes, he gave me clothes, unquote. A little bit of housekeeping here. Robert Cornell could have been Robin Cornette. The Appalachian accent can be misunderstood by people outside of the mountains and is not used to the dialect. Also, Smith was under a murder charge for the death of Dr. John E. Rader of Breathitt County. He states that he could have also participated in the assassination of Combs, but he was wounded from a duel that he had with a town marshal man on the streets of Jackson, Kentucky. Smith also confesses to participation in the murders of Shade Combs. Even though his confession really had no legal standing with the trial of Atkins and Fields, it did help to convict the two men of the charges. By explaining how each of the murders took place, it made the prosecution's case much easier for the jury to understand. Smith's confession also named French as being the leader and giving his blessing to each of the murders. This caused French to be arrested, charged, and acquitted for the murders at a later date. The defense takes the stand. According to the Hazel Green Herald, Hazel Green, Wolf County, Kentucky, May 2, 1895. Quote, The Herald, Spencer Cooper, Editor, The Fields-Atkins Trial. The Commonwealth in the Fields-Atkins case closed its testimony at Barbersville last week with a dramatic scene by the widow of Joseph Everso, a daughter of Judge Combs, whom Atkins and Fields were charged with having killed. Colonel Breckenridge, for the defense, stated that the case of his clients to the jury. Fields and Atkins both swore to an alibi and corroborated each other in the principal part of their evidence. Fields was the first witness. Atkins was next placed on the stand, but failed to corroborate the statement of Fields as to their whereabouts on September 28th, the day that Judge Combs was killed. Both testified that they were in Breathitt County that day, some 30 to 35 miles from the scene of the tragedy. The evidence so far has been very conclusive as to Atkins' guilt, but the Commonwealth has failed to connect Fields in any direct way with the killing. It seems as if most of the witnesses were afraid to divulge any more of the matter than they were compelled to do. One witness for the Commonwealth testified to having seen Marion French, son of B.F. French, in Hazard the morning that Judge Combs was killed. The prosecution claimed that it would be able to show that young French was there to carry out a contract that his father had made with Fields and Atkins. Andy Turner was the first witness introduced by the Commonwealth. He stated that he saw Jesse Fields some five or six miles below Hazard on Sunday morning of the killing. Newt Barker of Hazard testified that he saw Marion French, son of B.F. French, the Saturday evening before the killing, and also saw him in Hazard Sunday morning a few moments after Judge Combs was killed. Then Reuben Baker, who was at the time jailer of Perry County, stated that he formed a party to pursue the persons who had killed Judge Combs and was positive that he saw Jesse Fields about five miles below Hazard on that morning and thought that at the time Fields was wounded. Chester Everso, the 10-year-old son of Joseph C. Everso, testified on the morning his grandfather was killed, he was standing at the doorway of the residence of Judge Josiah Combs and saw his grandfather shot and also saw Joe Atkins fire the fatal shot from behind a post in the garden. After the prosecution closed its principal evidence, Colonel Breckenridge moved that the court give the jury preemptory instructions to quit Fields, but the motion was overruled. Barbersville Correspondence, Courier Journal, unquote. Both Fields and Atkins would be convicted of the crime of murder and sentenced to life in prison. They would appeal this conviction. Appeal This story comes out of the Wichita Daily Eagle, Wichita, Kansas, January 17, 1896. 
the Elon Miner, Elon, Minnesota, January 22nd, 1896, and the Salt Lake Herald, Salt Lake City, Utah, January 18th, 1896. Quote, Frankfort, Kentucky, January 16th, the Court of Appeals today reversed the life sentence of Jesse Fields and Joe Atkins of Perry County, who were sentenced for the murder of County Judge Combs. The main grounds given in a lengthy opinion by Judge Grace are, in brief, that the defendants were not given power to bring their witnesses from the county where the tragedy occurred, and these witnesses, with material evidence, were not present, unquote. The Second Trial According to the semi-weekly Interior Journal, Stanford, Kentucky, July 28, 1896, quote, The second trial of Joe Atkins and Jesse Fields for the murder of Judge Combs will be called at Barbersfield today. This newspaper clipping comes from the Morning Times, Washington, D.C., on January 2, 1897. Quote, Life sentence for Atkins, Louisville, Kentucky, January 1st. At Barbersville, Joe Atkins, a member of the French faction of the French ever so few fame, was convicted and given a life sentence for the brutal murder of Judge Josiah Combs at Hazard, Perry County, Kentucky. Combs was the father-in-law of Joe Everso, leader of the faction bearing his name, and the murder of the old man was the last of a long series of homicides resulting from the feud, unquote. According to the book, Kentucky Famous Feuds and Tragedies by Charles G. Musenberg, the trial ended with Jesse Fields being acquitted and Joseph Atkins receiving a life sentence. Atkins did not spend long in prison as he was released later under mysterious circumstances. Just a few years later, Jesse Fields would soon meet his fate as feuding would be the cause of his downfall. The Death of Jesse Fields Another death of a person who has been active in the French Eversol feud was reported at the Hazel Green Herald, Hazel Green, Kentucky, on May 3, 1900. It states the following, quote, Another killing in Breathitt. On Tuesday, April 27th, just after dusk, Jesse Fields was shot near Cornet's store on Smith Branch in Breathitt County, six miles from Jackson, by Moses Feltner, and died about 2 o'clock a.m. Jesse Fields took an active part in the French Eversol feud in Perry County a few years ago. At the time of his death, he was under indictment and bond to answer at the next term of court for the shanty boat tragedy on the Kentucky River near Jackson, which occurred a short time ago. Unquote. Overlooked History We had previously talked about this shooting and how it might have sparked the resurrection of the feud. However, we rediscovered something interesting in this article. Elizabeth Polly Ann Mattingly Combs, otherwise known as Polly Combs, was listed as a person being wounded in the feud. According to the Crichton Press on May 25, 1893, quote, London, Kentucky, May 20th. That bloody war that was waged so fearfully a few years ago in Perry County between the Eversol and French factions and which everybody was hoping had been settled forever, has again broken out. The fight resulted in the instant death of Jesse Hale and the serious wounding of Polly Ann Combs, the grandmother of Cash and John Eversoll. Jesse Field received two wounds, one in the arm and one in the back, and John Eversoll received a pistol wound in the wrist, unquote. Polly Combs would be the first woman to be wounded in this feud. It is not clear in this article if she obtained these wounds by accidental shooting as a bystander or if it was intentional as she was the wife of Judge Josiah Combs. However, because she was shot, the women of the area were no longer kept out of the feud. When she lost her husband, she decided to take her cause to the court of law and sue for damages to her family by the French faction. As we have stated before, Judge Combs' death was on September 23, 1894, and it was devastating to the family, and the accused had went to court and been tried and convicted for the crime. It is unclear if Combs took an active role in the feud, but he did take sides when he refused to bring charges against his son-in-law, Joseph C. Everso, and tried to bring the French faction to justice for their actions in the conflict. 
His death would be the moment that the violence of Perry County would cease and everything would play out in the court of law. However, Polly Combs was not about to let his death go unanswered by Fulton French. Fulton French Court Woes A very surprising twist happened during the murder trial of Judge Josiah Combs. One of the French most loyal and trusted lieutenants of the conflict, Tom Smith, began to give a full confession the moment he realized he was not going to succeed in court and that he was going to face the gallows. His confession would lead to charges being brought against French for murder. He would be indicted for these charges. According to the Morning Times, Washington, D.C., January 2, 1897, quote, Fears Assassination, Lexington, Kentucky, October 3rd. B.F. French, leader of the famous French Eversole Mountain Feud, who has been indicted on the charge of murdering Judge Combs, will not go to Perry County for trial until he has a guard. He fears the Eversoles will assassinate him, unquote. However, against these protests, French would go to trial for the murder plot of Combs. While French was going through the court system on these charges, he would be facing more charges by the widow Combs. Lawsuit Filed The lawsuit would be filed on January of 1896, just two years after the death of Judge Combs, which makes it all the more puzzling as to why this played out the way it did in the court system. According to the Mount Sterling Advocate in their January 21st, 1896 edition, quote, In the Perry Court, the widow of Judge Josiah Combs has filed suit against Fulton French, charging him with being an accessory to the murder of her husband, unquote. This would not be a simple slap on the wrist. Elizabeth Polly Ann Madeline Combs would bring a lawsuit against Fulton French to answer for her husband's murder. This suit would claim $10,000 in damages, which would equate to $250,000 in today's money. According to the comment in the January 23, 1896 edition, quote, Fulton French of the French Eversole feud fame has been sued for $10,000 damages by the widow of Judge Josiah Combs, who charges French as being an accessory to the murder of her husband, unquote. Fulton French had just escaped going to the gallows or life in prison for his leadership in the feud so far. He was charged with plotting the murder of Judge Combs through the testimony of Tom Smith. And now he was facing a lawsuit from the widow Combs for the unlawful death of her husband and she was seeking major damages. Verdicts The courts for the time being would be on French side of things. As the gallows testimony and confession was deemed to not being legally worthy to stand up in a court of law. And so French was acquitted of any wrongdoing in this case. As for the lawsuit brought by the widow Combs, according to the Daily Public Ledger, Maysville, Kentucky, January 16, 1896, and other listed sources, quote, Jackson, Kentucky, January 16, Fulton French of the French Eversole feud fame has been sued in Perry Circuit Court at Hazard for $10,000 damages by the widow Judge Josiah Combs, charging French with being accessory to the murder of Judge Combs, but recovery cannot be had on account of the statutes of limitations, unquote. Even though the lawsuit would take place within five years of the murder of her husband, Judge Josiah Combs, the widow Combs lost her case due to the statute of limitations at the time. But this was not a total victory for French, as he would face a bigger lawsuit in the Breathitt County War for the murder of Markham. While this feud ends the French Eversole feud in Perry County, many of the same people would continue the feud in Breathitt and Leslie Counties. This feud would officially end with the death of Benjamin French at the hands of the son of his enemy, Joseph C. Eversole, and a truce would be made between the two factions shortly afterward. Thank you. We at Kentucky Tennessee Living would like to thank you for watching our video series on the Appalachian Feuds. Don't forget to hit that like button as the more likes we receive, the more likely YouTube is to suggest our videos to other viewers. 
Also, to receive notice when we upload a new video, be sure to subscribe and click the bell notification. We thank you for continuing to support Kentucky Tennessee Living as we are discovering the mysteries of Appalachian history.